Today we are going to complete the discussion we started last time about task analysis and in particular analysis and synthesizing of results that we can extract for instance from interviews but not only. And we are going to see uh, two methods for task analysis, uh, one slightly deeper than the other, and then we move on on other techniques for synthesizing and presenting in a systematic way results and information. So first of all, task recomposition through the hierarchical task analysis. That is one of the possible methods for task decomposition. So starting from a task, deriving the steps of the task. Um, and basically is a procedure which defines steps, plans, and some other criteria to take a task, a higher level task, a higher level goal, and describe it in terms of subtask, what we call the steps the other time, so that it could be analyzed or presented using the logical sequence of the execution and allowing us to see if there are any problems in the execution. And this clearly depends and the outcome of this task and what is, which are the content of this task clearly depends what we are using for the hierarchical task analysis. If you're using the hierarchical task analysis for describe an activity that we observed or we uh, obtained through contextual inquiry or similar, we will have tasks that are and steps that are very similar to what happened in the real world. Instead, if we're using a task analysis to uh, describe or analyzing the steps that we are doing in our application for doing some task, then this task would be, the steps would be close to our application. So we are continuing with the example of last time to clean up the house in this, in this case. So we have here, there is a sample task decomposition, more than hierarchical task analysis of better. It's a hierarchical task analysis, but not in the formalism that typically um, it's, it's done. But anyway, clean the house, the steps that we have last time, so get the vacuum cleaner out, fix the appropriate attachment, clean the room, empty the dusty bag, and put the vacuum cleaner and attachment away. And here, we add a hierarchy. So we have the high level goal that is zero, clean the house, and then we have the first level of task, get the vacuum cleaner, fix the appropriate attachment, etc. And then here we have an additional level of hierarchy about subtask steps that we didn't have last time. That is a specialization of what means clean the rooms. That means clean the hall, clean the living room, clean the bathroom. So this is an example, hierarchical task analysis. And you see describe task in hierarchy and subtask and a set of plans hmm, on how to do the task hierarchically reported before. Hmm. And here we have, for instance, two plans. The plan zero, hmm, that is called zero because it's related to the step zero here, that describe how these steps are needed to be done in terms of order, in terms of condition, in terms of if they are mandatory or not. So for instance, here say that for plan zero, uh, steps one, two, three, and five must be done in that order. Hmm? Clearly you have to get the, clean, the vacuum cleaner out before cleaning the room. You cannot clean the room before getting out the vacuum cleaner. Hmm? So that is the order, but for subtask number four, hmm, you only need to do that when the dust bag gets full. Otherwise, you can skip task number four, subtask number four. So it describes that task number four is actually not mandatory and it has an option, a condition attached. When it's full, do task number four. Otherwise, skip it. 
And similarly, for plan three, where three is related to the subtask three in this case, let's say that 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 can be done in any order. Clearly, it's not mandatory to clean one room before the other. The importance is that you do three rooms in whatever order you prefer. So these are the steps, but the plans allow to give more information, more context to the steps and their execution. And you can also, as written here in this corner, you can also refine additionally this plan by adding knowledge that are not included in the uh, task hierarchy. So not only about mandatory or not mandatory or about the order, but you can say, okay, 3.1, clean the hole, needs to be done every day. And 3.2, once a week. And 3.3, only when visitors are due. And only when you have visitor, you have to do 3.3, .3, otherwise you can skip. And these steps, again, emerge from an observation, emerge from an interview, emerge from something that tell you that in that context, people do this task in this order, in this way, with this condition, with this context, etc. It's not that something you, you decide that 3.1 needs to be done every day, but you serve typically this and you get this context and you try to put on paper which are the common operation, the order, etc. So this is the basic hierarchy that typically is depicted in this way, so more as, as a hierarchy, as a graph. Um, but, wait, um, first, first of all, first of, before getting there, um, clearly, we, we can ask ourselves how, uh, when we should stop to decompose task. Hmm? I mean, clean the rooms is decomposed in clean the hall, clean the living room, and clean the bedroom. Is that enough, or should we decompose it again? Hmm? So clean the hall means clean the, the walls and clean the floor, and clean the walls means this, this, and that. Hmm? Should we stop here to clean the hall at this level of, let's say, abstraction, or we should decompose them further? Hmm? And the answer, it typically depends. Um, depends, on, again, on what you are building the, the task for, the task analysis for, from which data, let's say, you are building the task analysis and for which purpose. Uh, but typically, subtasks need to be ex uh, expanded, decomposed, until the user that needs to see this task analysis or use this task analysis, so the people that need to use the task analysis, have clear in mind what they need to do hmm, with the task analysis. Um, so each task is decomposing subtask, answering the question which subtask must be accomplished in order to perform the main upper task, the parent. And again, all of these came out from observation, expert opinion, documentation, etc. And to understand, in many cases, which are the subtasks, you can also ask, hmm? okay, you did step three. What, what happens if the bag of the vacuum cleaner is full? Oh, well, I need to empty them. What, what happens if I don't know, the vacuum cleaner is a battery and the battery is, uh, is, is empty. Oh well, I need to recharge it. Hmm? And so this list of tasks will clearly change and refine according to this additional information that you can get from hmm, people. Um, so when tasks can be decomposed, in this case it's written expand, well, tasks need to expand or decompose, as, as I said before, when they are obvious to the user and when they don't contain any risk of failure that are hidden or any unclear points, any question like, and how, I, and now I, how I'm going to do this? And this is clear a question that you don't want to, to include uh, as a task. You want an answer to this question in your task description. 
Uh, and as a rule of thumb, you typically expand only the relevant task. So the most important task for the process, you are going to use it. Again, if you're using for designing something, for better understand something, you can probably go deep on some task and a little bit less on others if you are, let's say, doing a, a mobile application for house cleaning. Uh, instead, if you are doing documentation or troubleshooting for a vacuum cleaner, you probably need to go down better, let's say, on the empty the bag. How to empty the bag from the vacuum cleaner? If I'm writing the manual for the vacuum cleaner, I need to specify which are the steps for empty the bag of the vacuum cleaner. What happens if something goes wrong? So expanding or refining the hierarchy as well. And here there is another example of hierarchy in the task decomposition in a hierarchical task analysis. Uh, it's about making a cup of tea with probably more details that we, uh, we, we, we typically use. Uh, but typically a hierarchical task analysis drawn in this way. You have the first task and then all its subtask with a hierarchical relationship and the plan for each task is between the first level and the second level. Similarly for each subtask. And then when a, a square, a subtask, or any task has a, another line in the end, it say that this task doesn't need to be decomposed further. So it stopped there. You will not expect a further decomposition, like for boil water, for instance. And so here we have a plan for making a cup of tea. Uh, sorry, a task. The task, our goal is making a cup of tea and the plan is do one and at the same time, if the pot is full, do two, then three and four, and then after four or five minutes, do six. That's the plan now to execute the, the other level of, uh, of task. And similarly for plan one, uh, do one, dot one, dot two, dot three, and then when the kettle boils, do, do one, dot four. So looking at this, there is at least one thing that is missing, and you can probably easily, one activity that is missing. Turn on the gas. You turn off the gas here, but you never turn on the gas. So if you do it twice, maybe you have the gas turn on, and then you do it, then you arrive here, turn off the gas, and then if you do it again, following exactly this instruction, you will never turn on the gas. If you just follow these rules. So we, we need probably to change something here before putting the kettle on the gas to say, turn on the gas. So, tasks, as I told you last time, just to, to stress this again, are typically, in this case, are explanation of goals. So if we ask a person what you're doing now, this person can reply all of these things. We already did a similar example last time, just to, to give you another example. So what are you doing now? I'm typing control B to make a, a word bold or I'm making a word bold, or I am emphasizing a word, that bold is a way to emphasize a word, or I'm editing a document by emphasizing a word, making it bold, pressing, control B, or I'm writing a letter, so not editing a general document, specifically a letter, or I'm preparing a legal, key, a legal case that is the letter, that is the document that needs to emphasize the word, etc. So the task are a way for us to explain which is the high level goal of the person. And all the task analysis is also strongly linked to goals, as we said last time. So with goals also in mind, and we analyzing very well the process, we can refine the, the description. So for instance, we have off without on. And then we can say, well, we, we should probably be expert on making tea, I'm not in this level, that uh, empty pot and 
put, uh, sorry, put tea leaves in pot and pour in boiling water can be make pot as a group of tasks that describe these two and others that are missing. Uh, and then we can also ask ourselves, is the level of complexity of important tasks the same across the hierarchy, or we need to specify more something, or to rewrite something? And say, it's poor T here, number six, simpler hmm, as a concept than make pot that we're going to add here to include three and four. And what happens if we want to make one or more cups of tea? Because here the task is make a cup of tea, only one. If we want to do three, what are we going to do? We're going to repeat this process three times, or we need to change something here, like pick up bigger kettle and a bigger pot and put inside more tea leaves. Or we are just doing to repeat the same task multiple times. This is again a simple example, but I love you to, to think about what, are, what things to, to ask to people, what things to reflect on after observing or interviewing people, or what thing to write somewhere to describe some activity, some process to other people that are not you. Hmm? Maybe you have everything clear, but this is for also for synthesizing, so for describing to the others what you are doing and which are the tasks that they need to do, the steps that they need to do to reach the goal. Hmm? So checking the match direction off and on, restructuring, also balancing complexity, and try to generalize, to think, okay, it happens that you want to do more than one cup of tea? Yes, no, and what happens in this case? What do you need to do this? Again, cycle on this or just change something in, in between? So here there is a modified that includes all of this thing, in which we have make pot, that replace the previous two tasks that were put here and adds warm pot at the beginning. Hmm? So boil water with fill kettle, put kettle on knob, turn on the gas, wait for kettle to boil, and then turn off the gas when it's done, and then empty the pot, and then if, if, if it's full, and then make the pot, that is warm the pot, put the leaves in the pot and pour in boiling water, and then wait for five minutes, at least, because you would say after four or five minutes, do five. Okay, yes, the same. Um, and then pour tea. What means pour tea? Put me in cup, fill the cup with tea. If the cups are empty, you can, if you still have cups on the table, you can continue to put milk in the cup and fill the cup with tea, and then for each guest, ask the sugar. And the sugar is actually ask guest about sugar, and then if they reply yes, add sugar to taste. So here we add the on, the new subtask that also add the warm pot, and what happens if, if I need to, amp, to do more cups with the same pot and the same kettle? And also add a, an interactive part, that is ask people if they want sugar or not. Mm? And we can imagine to refine this again, mm? like what if I don't want milk in the cup? Mm? I can do the same things for do sugar, like do milk, and then ask guests if they want milk, and if they say yes, add milk. To, to taste and then change this plan clearly with a question. Hmm? So this is again the same simple hierarchical task as before with just more detail and more things that we, we didn't think before, we didn't have before, maybe we didn't need it before, but reflecting and thinking about it, we discover that there are missing pieces and that if we need for any reason to describe how to make a proper cup of tea, we can say follow this. Hmm? There is a nice video that is totally related to this on YouTube, uh, in which um, maybe all on social media, uh, in which that is 
that would have been solved with a proper hierarchical task analysis in which you have a father that is asked from uh, her son, his son and his daughter to uh, make a peanut butter sandwich. And he's following strictly the instruction, the task that the son gives to, to him. Mm? So if they say pick a piece of bread, he, he pick up a, a piece of bread. And they say put the, mm, uh, the peanut button, butter on it, it takes the, the peanut butter, the, 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 the container with the peanut butter in it and put it on the piece of, a piece, piece of bread. And that is a, a, a task, you know, do a peanut butter, the bread and the peanut butter on it. But it's not, it's clearly done on purpose, but again, he's trying not to, to teach the hierarchical task analysis, but to uh, well explain which are the steps. And so you'll see in the video that the, the son and the daughter uh, try to refine the task, like open the, the peanut butter and pick a, uh, something to take the peanut butter and put the peanut butter, butter on the bread, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, they eventually are able to, but after like five or six minutes of video. Um, and this is something, so that was again another simple task and that was clearly made on purpose, but it's another example in which if you need to describe something slightly more complex than this, or in a domain that you are not very well very well uh, expert on that domain, having a clear and precise set of tasks will allow you to think about pain points, to think about a workaround, to think about how people do things, and how you also, if this is for documentation, think about the processes of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So you can also tell people how, which are the steps precisely without leaving interpretation in the middle and causing them problem. So all, all of this is the hierarchical uh, task analysis. Um, plans. Plans have these um, seven types of um, possibilities. Uh, one is the fixed sequ sequence, but we are, I've, I've seen most of them. The fixed sequence. Do one, then two, then three, or then five. Mm? Uh, then optional task. If the pot is full, do two. If the vacuum cleaner bag is full, do four, etc. cetera. Uh, wait for events. When kettle boils, at that point, do these other subtask. Cycles, like the one for doing multiple cups. Time sharing, do this and at the same time, do that. You can do, in, in the T case, while the kettle boil, you can also do something else where you wait. You don't have to wait for the water to be to boil, to end boiling before preparing anything else. You can do it in parallel. And this is something that you cannot see from the hierarchical task analysis, but you can write and describe um, here. At the same time, do this. So don't wait. But it's not immediate, immediately perceived from the, the drawing. Uh, discretionary, like in the, in the case of the, of the rooms, do eight of these in any order that you prefer, and mixture, so you can also have some plans, most of the plans actually has fixed sequence, plus maybe optional task, plus maybe wait for events all together with different clearly subtask. So you have this main construct, to the plan, so six plus putting some of the others together to describe a plan like in the picture. And this is your hierarchical task analysis. Hmm? So a way to very well describe step by step how you have to do a task. Hmm? It's also called the task decomposition because you decompose a task, a general task into something low level until the people understand exactly, specifically what they need to do. Another way to do uh, task analysis, but not task decomposition, is what is called the knowledge-based analysis. That instead has, has the aim, more specifically, to understand which knowledge, and to write it down, which knowledge is required for accomplishing a task. 
So the knowledge base analysis focus on object in task and the action performed. And our way typically to help you organize better information, also some, in some cases the navigation and application, etc., because you try to understand which are the knowledge, the specific concept, the specific words that in that context are used. And this is typically done through uh, taxonomy, hmm, that try to group and organize information on different level of uh, abstraction. Hmm. So for instance, this is a taxonomy, hmm, a way to, know, to analyze a specific domain. Hmm. So these are car controls, and car controls are of type motor controls, and within motor controls you have steering, and what is about steering? The steering wheel is an indicator. And then you have the engine and speed, and you have the direct type of engine speed, that is injection, acceleration, foot brake, and then you have the gearing. And then you have lights at the same level to the other, that could be external or internal. And the external lights are the headlights and the hazard lights. The internal lights are the cortis lights. It's just describe a specific domain. The car control could be this, and we have lights, and the lights could be of two types, and in between two types, these are the lights that you are going to expect in a car. So that if you want to, let's say, write a manual again about a car, you know which are the parts. And if you have to do a, an application for in-car control, and this application needs to have to do with lights and their positioning, Maybe if they're working or not, you need to, to know how many lights you have in a car. You cannot skip one. Oh, I, I forget about this light. Let's not put it in the, in the screen. So you have to know very, very well which is the structure of the car, which is the exact name. So how we generate concept? Well, typically we generate concept from documentation, observing things, uh, or asking hmm, people, expert maybe, to list which are the, the various concept, but also with interviews to extract nouns, verb, about the action, and then we can group together the concept according to specific relationship that we have. And to group things together, we can have a, a, a functional decomposition in most cases, or a positional decomposition, especially with things in the real world. And the functional decomposition is what they do, while the positional is where they are. So you can categorize, okay, we have the wash, wipe, and then we have the wipers and the washers, two categories. One do the wipes and the other one the washes. And it's what they do, separate set of, of functions that they have. Or you can have the, the positional hmm, description Within wash and wipe, we have those in the front and those in the back. And then we lose the fact that they are weepers or washers. But still, we describe them in a category, not functional, but positional based. And these are both of you that are useful, and typically they're useful in different contexts. If you want to explain where things are, clearly the position of the composition is better, because you can tell them where they are. If, so look at the front. In the front you should see one, two, three things. Hmm? And instead if you were able to describe how things work and you are less interested in where they are, you can say, okay, I have wipers and you have two of them and these are the wipers and these are what they do. Hmm? So again, different context, different goal. You can change the um, the composition. Uh, then there are more complex formalism, just to let you know, uh, that aims to capture various point of view together hmm, with Boolean operators, like in this case, but just to let you know that exist. And when we use taxonomy, well, for instance, this is an example of taxonomies in play. What is a typeface? A typeface, which are the categories of a typeface, of a font. You have the font name, you have the style, 
you have the size, you have the color. All the attributes about a font are these. You, you don't have other attributes about a font. The name, the style, the dimension, the color. Then you can have effects that can be applied, but they are independent of the specific font name you choose or the specific size you choose or the specific color you choose. And so this uh, dialogue here explores different concepts in the taxonomy. So here there is one taxonomy, here there is more or less another, and then here there is a preview. So moving in the dialogue, you can actually navigate the taxonomy and various elements in the taxonomy and see the relationship between the various things. So if you select Times New Roman, you have all the style and the dimension, maybe others don't have all the style available, and maybe, well, all the dimension probably they have. So this is an example of where you apply taxonomy. You need to know the wording, because here you're going to call it font name. And you are going to call it style, and you're going to call it dimension, and not uh, something else. And the um, all caps is all caps. And we find this same wording, more or less, in all the word editing program, word processor program, is well-known taxonomy that we use and all the programs consistently use. They don't reinvent a word every time. So this, is, this was probably done at the beginning with something like the knowledge base analysis, understanding which are domains about font and how to represent them in all, without missing any details about font. So imagine not having the size in a word processor because somebody decided that forgot about the size of a font. It's not something you can miss if you're doing a word, a word processor. And the same things happen in, in other domain. Knowing which are the knowledge, the words, the action that you, you have to do, some will be more important and mandatory, and they will be, let's say, in the front page, and others will be optional, and they will be in some dialogue window, in some option, like in this case, where, again, you have types, uh, name, style, and, and size here, but also you have that in the main window of Word, while other effects, this one here, are instead, some of these are only here. You cannot find easily in the front page of Word. So you go here because these are the less popular, less, less used than the others, and so you have to, to do one more step by design, but still all these concepts are here, are present in the application and are recognized by the people that use this application, or by learning, or because they, they knew it. Okay, and this is about task analysis in general. So two methods, um, and, and we are going to ask you to apply one of them in the future, not right now. But we are going to, tell, to create in your project three tasks at a certain point, and probably you, you will need to do a little bit of task analysis to understand which are the three, um, which are the steps and the goals and the feature hmm, in your three tasks for your project. Another way to represent information, totally different from task analysis, but still strongly related to the concept of task, are scenarios and storyboards. Um, actually, storyboard are, is a sort of scenario. So what is a scenario? A scenario, well, maybe you know it from software engineering? Yes, no, maybe, yes. So what is a scenario? You know it from software engineering, so you did software engineering last semester, so you now should be expert on this. What is a scenario? Which kind of scenario you did or learned? Or should have done or should have learned? Mm. 
Mm, a, a series, yes, but describing, okay, it, it's right, it's sort of right, and this is you know, similar to, to the task analysis in a way, to the task decomposition in a way, in which you have a series of steps to have to do to achieve a certain goal. Mm? That could be more user-facing, more software-facing, but it's still a goal. Okay, but this is a list, like one, two, three, four, or it's something else? It's more descriptive, right? Yeah, you, you have a lot of other contextual information because they are more typically sort of stories, hmm? stories of interaction that they can be done in a descriptive way, like you probably have seen in software engineering, sort of use case also, hmm? and our description of how the user engage with an interactive system to reach a goal, to solve a specific task. Again, task. We are still speaking about task. And there are actually various formats of scenarios. There is the written one that is more about story. Uh, there are the graphical one that are the storyboards. And then you can also have flowchart, transition diagram, mixing things together. Uh, which kind did, did you see at software engineering? Who did software engineering? The written, the graphical? The written and we are going to see the graphical instead, clearly. Uh, so, which are the levels of details in a scenario? We can have various kinds of scenarios. Um, we can have what is typically also called the user story. That is actually a story of how a person want to do and do with any interactive system. Could be software, hardware, a door, whatever thing you can interact with, not even a system. And these stories are typically get from the need finding, from the observation, from the interviews, you extract some story of how people use something in practice. Then you have conceptual or abstract scenarios that are instead used for generating idea and specifying requirements. And these, again, are not stories, like this person is going, doing that for this at this time of the year, etc., but are abstract tasks that stem from stories. And a specification of the, the abstract scenario is that they don't have a reference to technology most of the time, and they are, because they are abstract. So they don't tell how you do something with a computer or that you use a computer or anything else specifically. It's just an abstract representation of the story that you have written before. So something more specific with respect to the story, but still abstract, this conceptual. You are describing concept. You want to generate ideas by this scenario. They could be, again, written or not. Then you have the concrete scenarios that are again used for envisioning ideas and also for evaluation. And the concrete scenario are one of the possible solution to the conceptual scenario. You can have one conceptual scenario and you can have 10 concrete scenarios that represent possible solution of that, com that conceptual scenario. And those concrete scenarios show how technology are used to solve a problem in the user context, so at home, at work, with a computer, in a crowded place, on a subway, etc. And the key design features are included in the scenario, where they are missing from the stories and from the conceptual. And then you have the use cases that are used instead of more for specification and implementation, and that is something that I, you should learn, or you should have learned from software engineering. So we. But still, is a kind of is, is, is a sort is a scenario is in the family of scenarios. So we are focusing mostly on conceptual and concrete scenarios, and we are going to do it graphically, not written, hmm? with storyboards. Um, and, and you know the difference between conceptual scenario and concrete scenario is a little bit like the difference between design and implementation of 
an application, which is the difference between design and implementation of an application, a software application, like in software engineering or in a programming course, only your thesis when you will have to write one or do one. Yes, in design you have the architecture, the view of the components, how they interact with each other, and in implementation you have more details like? Like how uh, you for example, More or less? You, if you think about software implementation and software design, you have one thing in implementation that you don't have in design. The code, yes. And not only the code, but is related to the code. If I want to design, no, not necessarily. If I need to design, let's say, an application for booking, meeting, a calendar, a calendar application. So in the design, I will going to put, uh, it's a web application. So what we are going to speak about in the design. This is sort of the difference between concept and concrete also. So you want to design a web application with a calendar that does the things that the calendar does. So you can create events, delete events, edit events, invite people to the events. These are the features. What you're going to put in the design. The feature, the requirements, and? The interface, like a drawing, and? No, exactly not that. The framework you're using is implementation. The components in a general way, yes. So you're going to say, okay, my, Calendar will have three components, one representing the main page, one representing this, one representing the events, and the events will speak with this, and interact with this, and exchange data over HTTP. And then in implementation, you're going to say how you did that in practice. I did it in Java, I did it in React, I did it in Python, I did it, that is the implementation. How you concretize the design system. But the design system, in theory, should be something that every developer can pick and implement it as they want, without st strong constraint on the code, on the framework used, on the language used, etc. It should be more abstract, hmm? describing what you want to do, which are the features, which are the components, which are the interaction with the components, and not how today is done in, let's say, React on how today is done in JavaScript, or in Java, or in Python, whatever. But separate the concrete part, that is the implementation, what you're going to do today, with technology X, with method X that are valid now, and the design that, again, should be something that you give another person, and they should be able to reproduce that with whatever technology they want to do. So this is sort of the difference also between conceptual and concrete. That's why there is no reference to technology in the conceptual. You describe how things should work, not exactly how they, you make it work now. This is more for concrete scenarios. And this also applies to software design implementation. Okay, storyboards. Storyboards are comics, basically. So a graphical representation, so the, the definition is a graphical depiction of the outward appearance, outward appearance of an intended system without any accompanying system functionality. It's again a story of how a person accomplishes a specific task. Just drawing that story in a comic-like fashion. Uh, storyboards are typically hand-drawn. Hmm? Uh, and with a few panels and try to, like nine in this case, try to accomplish what a person is, uh, try to describe what a person is going to 
to accomplish, and since he's trying to describe what a person is going to accomplish, is including people. So storyboards always include people. It's more easy that a storyboard include people than technology, than images of technologies. Because again, they communicate flows and show what happens at key points in time. So here we see one person that was is walking, then is checking the phone for messages, probably, then enter a room, and probably there is something written on, on the wall, but it's too, too small, etc. So it describes a story that brings to, to a map, in this case, to go somewhere. And a storyboard is synthesizing and analyzing is about communicating idea, is about reflecting on idea, is about generating, representing ideas. And storyboards can be done on, on paper like this, or you can also have a video storyboard that are clearly recorded with video, web cameras, etc. but we are thinking about the paper, let's say, storyboard, hmm? the image-based storyboard, and drawn. And storyboards are all about task. That's why we spoke about task analysis before. Because we illustrate something that is related to a task. We can demonstrate, illustrate the goal related to a task. We can demonstrate the task itself if it's not complex, if it's not too complex, or some main points of the task. So making the tea, hmm, that could be a storyboard about making a tea. And then we represent in the storyboard the key points about making the tea, the key problem that the person is facing, the key solution that the person is, is doing to make a cup of tea, hmm, or use whatever system. And clearly it has a beginning with a problem. I want to do X and storyboards end with thanks to Y, I accomplish my goal, I do my task, and I do whatever I wanted to do. But again, let me stress this out again. Storyboards are all about task. So here there is an example of a storyboard. You see end drawn, you don't have to be, you can also do a storyboard when uglier, let's say, than this, it's fine. And you also have some text here describing. So what, what is this storyboard about? Which is the task that the person is, which is the problem, which is the solution of the, of the problem that the, the person has? He needs to cook the food, but which is the problem? He doesn't have things, but. Yes, that is why he needs signal on, on the subway. Because it's late and, and he should have checked what to cook, so there is nothing at home for cooking. So he has a problem. It's late, not at home. I don't know what is in the fridge. Probably I don't have enough things in the fridge, but I need to eat something, clearly. So this is the problem. And here there is something. What to say it is? He uses an app that suggests this person that tonight um, he can cook curried kitchen, chicken, that is only 222 calories. And here we can see another thing that we are missing before. We also have calories. So probably it's something to do with diet, not to exceed the calories or to keep calories in range for the day. So it's not, I don't have anything to cook, let's order a pizza. But I don't have anything to cook, and I can cook this, that is simple. Here, instructions, and like I can do that. It's simple for the person. It helps, this application helps to 
do the grocery shopping, this figure here, and then in the end, the person is happy and he's eating his curried chicken. Hmm? It is, again, only 232 calories. So with six um, images, we say that we have a problem. We have a specific kind of people in mind, the ones that are busy and late and don't have anything in the, in the fridge. And we don't have mobile signal, hmm? but the app, whatever it is, is still working, even without the signal. And this app that is still working because it's late, et cetera, is able to suggest foods with calories and list of things to buy and instruction. These are the features of this app. I have an app on the smartphone that suggests me a recipe with calories, with the list of things to buy and the instruction. And it's simple so that I can do it quickly because it's late and I'm happy in the end. So there is the happy ending and the end, always in a storyboard. There is the user that accomplished the task. And this is a storyboard, one kind of storyboard. And did you see any screen of how the application is done? No. You know that there is a mobile application because you see that there is a phone and you know that it's working offline, but you know the feature, but you don't see how it appears. And this is again very, very common in storyboard. You want to describe the task, you want to describe the idea. You don't want to describe how it works specifically, where buttons are positioned. Here there is another example. Always people eating. What happens here? What is the problem here this person has? Yes, so it's late, first of all, it's 8 p.m. It's in front of the house and he didn't do any shopping. And this person is not go to go to the shopping, uh, to, go to go grocery shopping now, so he's going home. So going home, sitting on, on the couch and look for, let's say, uh, Just Eat or Glovo and say that the pizza takes 45 minutes to deliver, it's, it's already uh, past eight, so. It will have a pizza probably at 9 p.m. And so pizza takes too long, takeaway takes too long. So open the fridge, and in the fridge there are some veggies and some cheese. So differently from before, where the person find a recipe and go grocery shopping, here open the fridge, veggies and cheese. So it opened an app, again, that we don't know if already is installed, there's a web app, we don't know. It's, an app, it's a mobile phone, again, that's the only thing that we know. And we know that um, this person finds a recipe with exactly the same the thing that he has at home. Hmm? So this application is probably suggesting recipe according to the, the ingredients that the person has. And it's only 15 minutes. Hmm? So not only it found the ingredients, but also is quicker than the pizza. That is critical here. So it's late, quick, and with the ingredients that you have. And it's also, as before, easy to make, simple, and calories, also in this case. And then half an hour after, 8.30, this person eats. So here again, it shows how this application can present how to cook a, a, a meal quicker than getting the pizza with more, let's say, information and only by using the things that this person has at home without spending money, everything else. Hmm? Using ingredients left over in the fridge. Hmm? Again, this tells a story about one task 
and some features in a way of deprecation. And also in this case, we don't see deprecation. We see that it's looking at something. But you can, if you read this, understand which are the key points, the key, let's say, selling points of the application. That is, should, be, should present a recipe with a set of ingredients, calories, a recipe easy to make and quick to make in this case. While in the other storyboard, we didn't have, for instance, the quick to make. Here was missing. Here was the grocery shopping list. Still simple to do and still only 200 and something calories. And the goal was the same. Being late or, or not a lot and eating for dinner at the end, satisfactory in a way. So what storyboard convey? Storyboards should always convey these three things. They should convey the setting in which they are, the subway, at the home, at the work, etc. The people that are involved. Right now we have in these two examples just one person, but we can have storyboards including multiple people doing group activities. Uh, the sequence, the steps, the main steps that are involved. We don't see this person going out of the office, entering the subway station, exit the subway station, entering the, the supermarket. We don't see all of this. We just see this person at work and next image in the subway, next image inside the, the subway car, and then at the supermarket. We don't see what happens in the, in the beginning, in the middle, because it's not important to tell the story. What is happening in the, is, is walking, is, is moving from one place to the other. You can understand that after this is in the grocery shopping and this is at home, even if you don't see the people walking from one place to the other. And also here, you don't see the people walking from the couch to the, to the fridge and to the kitchen to whatever this person is, wherever this person is eating. You just see the key moments in time describing the sequence, the main steps that are involved. You don't see the user interface of anything. You just see if they're using some technology. You see which is the trigger for the task. It's late, I don't have anything at home. It's late, I don't have signal. And I can go doing grocery shopping. And you always, you see, you see which is the task illustrated. In the first case, grocery shopping plus cooking and the second case cooking. But the main task is still cooking in both cases. It's the starting point is different, but the end point is always the same. And satisfaction. So what's the motivation for the user? And the end results. And if the needs are satisfied, and the needs are depicted at the beginning, it's late, I need to count calories, etc. These are the feature of the application to represent the needs of this person that whose story is told in the, in the survey. So traditional storyboarding are the, like the one that we have seen, uh, like comic book convention. You have actors, you have people, you have speech bubbles, you have a little bit of background, like a comic book. Um, and you can have also have some notes attached to each scene explaining what's happening, like here, let's say, that is 8 p.m. Hmm? And here, these are like speech bubbles, hmm? even if they're not uh, represented. And also the, the yum here, the yum here, is not clearly something that you, you say, but is to give the idea in a comic book fashion that you want to do. Uh, you can also have score storyboard when it's highly dynamic or it contains specific media, uh, but it's not a traditional, so you have more movements, you have colors, you have sound, like instead here, you, they are just black and white, the traditional, and you can also have text-only storyboards. Uh, when interaction behavior is too complex, you revert back to, in a way, the scenario that are written. 
to use a long text description of what is happening, what's going, which is the context, which are the elements, the time, the hour, the place, the day of the week, etc. And storyboards are end drawn. Uh, the traditional storyboards are end drawn uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, because it's quick to do storyboard in this way. So you don't need to spend time in graphic tool. Your, your goal is to represent a story, to represent a, goal, a task. How a person accomplish a task starting from some needs. So you don't want to spend too much time doing that. And so you end round because it's quick. And also it's able allow you to experiment with different alternatives because it's quick. If, you took, if it took three hours to do a storyboard, in a limited amount of time, you will probably do two or three of them. If it takes 10 minutes, in the same amount of time of before, you can do 11, 10, 20 storyboards that you probably don't need, so you can not waste time in doing the storyboard. Uh, and they are imprecise because they are undrawn, and it's by, by design, they are imprecise because you can focus more on the content and not on the, oh, this person is not the same as the previous person, or this color is changed, or it's cloudy or not cloudy, uh, etc. So you're, you don't have distraction in fonts, in colors, in icons, neither you creating the storyboard, neither the person that is looking at the storyboard. And you can sketch people as you prefer. Um, there is also the Starman person to, to draw in this way, and it's it's fine to, to, to draw, to sketch people in various ways for the storyboard according to the, the skill, the drawing skill that you have, but also the stick people is, is fine. Everybody should be able to, to design a stick people. Also the star people is quite, it's quite easy. Um, and the benefits of storyboard are these four. It emphasizes how a system, an interface accomplishes a specific task focus on the conversation and the feedback on specific needs. And if shown to others, get everyone on the same page about the goal that the application, the system should, should accomplish and avoid too many details. So to do, oh, I don't like this button in this position, I don't like this, but help you to focus on the task, on the goal, and not to on the colors, on the position, on the button, on the user interface. That will be something to discuss, but later, before, you need to understand which are the goals and the activity that you have to do, okay? So this close the task analysis and the analysis and synthesizing. Uh, tomorrow, I will, we will do an exercise on the task analysis, probably, so on the task decomposition. And hopefully, I will also present to you the second assignment that will be about refining your project idea. Refining the need finding to reach a project idea, a specific project idea. Um, and then next week, we will start speaking about prototyping. And assignment three then will be about storyboards, tasks, and a first version of the prototype. Mm, that is the low fidelity prototype that we will speak about again next week. Mm, but tomorrow we will do an exercise on task analysis and hopefully I will present you the second assignment. Friday we will do the three slots, digital well-being first, uh, ER war for education second, and humans meet AI third, separately with groups to work on assignment two. So not feedback session, but work session. And for today, we can close here. If you have any other question, I will stay here for a few minutes.